here's here are the facts. The Earth has a nickel and iron core. Now this generates its magnetic field. However, the magnetosphere has large holes in it. The magnetosphere is a static shield. Now under routine solar conditions, it protects the Earth from coronal mass ejections. But when Planet X arrives, we're no longer under routine solar conditions. Uh, you look at uh, Air France, for example. Um, I think that was back in 2009, Air France 447. This is a little bit off topic, but really it's on topic because it's an excellent metaphor, an excellent visual type of illustration as to the power of Planet X. When Planet X hits, the utilities are going to be shut down for anywhere from three months on. There's going to be $5 trillion worth of damage to the electrical grid. But let's go back to Air France 447 back in 2009 to give you an example. There have been people that have postulated, and these are very intelligent people, and it's just a theory, but they have postulated that that disappeared over the mid-Atlantic range, right in the middle of the ocean. Now, that's involved with the Earth's earthquakes. The EMP between the mid-Atlantic range and Planet X could have caused its destruction. And the same thing with Malaysian flight, ME370. It may have flown into an EMP pulse. The flight path was highly irregular. That's indirect evidence. And this occurs when the north pole of Planet X is pointed directly at the Earth during its approach. Magnetrons and electrons burned out through an EMP event. I think the cell phones of the passengers as well burned out. So none of the theories really answer uh, in terms of those aircraft. All the questions are fully explained what happened that day. But it could be an indirect effect of the approach of Planet X. Now also, you mentioned these um, chemtrails. Now, there's a site I just became aware of it recently called Geoengineering Watch. I think Dane... Yeah, Wayne, great guy. Oh, you know him? Okay. Yeah, I've talked to him before. Oh, you've talked to him. Excellent. Well, you've you've probably heard the key phrase, indigo skyfold and so forth, and I, I understand that contrails dissipate quickly, but not chemtrails. And I always, you know, tell people, you know, in terms of NSA, nothing is as it appears to be. Always consider the source and their agenda. You, you look at Ted Gunderson, that former FBI chief, and he he said Congress should be investigating these chemtrails. And, uh, yeah, that so, was back in 97. That He actually came out and talked to Congress about it. Weather wars, chemtrails, everything. Really, I didn't keep up too much with the chemtrails controversy, but it's, it's likely, what, strontium, aluminum, oxide, and so forth? Barium salts, all sorts of other nanoparticulates. They were putting GMO, Ebola virus crap in there. I mean, there's it just depends on the day and the time and the location. But I, I do got to bring this up, too, because I've noticed for the past several days – the, the skies have been chemtrail-free. At least if they were doing it, they were doing it at nighttime when you couldn't see it because you didn't have the haze, you didn't see the, those nanoparticulates falling from the skies when they do the heavy chemtrail spray, and you can see with your polarized sunglasses on. So I'm wondering why, and I'm wondering if the chemtrails that they do have a part of trying to block out Nibiru if it's visible to the naked eye sometimes. I think that's very possible. I think they're attempting every type of disinformation possible. For example, let's look at what happened recently. Uh, and let's give you a little history on this. And you, you probably uh, know a lot of this, but for your listeners, you know, science admits quite a few points in favor of Planet X. Our, our solar system is surrounded by the Oort cloud, 50 to 200,000 AU astronomical units or Earth sun distances from our sun. And if if our sun is part of a binary system, which it is, and you have a common center of mass, this can disturb the Oort cloud and send comets or whatever toward us. Now, science also admits an asteroid impact is absolutely responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago in the Tunguska effect or event in Russia in 1908. I think that explosion had 1,000 times the power of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, flattened 80 million trees, 830, 840 square miles. Now. Here's the thing. Science admits a recently discovered dwarf planet named Sedna as an extra long and a rather unusual elliptical orbit around the sun. I think it's 76 to 900 AU. And Sedna's orbit is estimated 12,000 years. Uh, Mike Brown of Caltech said Sedna's location doesn't make any sense. Sedna shouldn't be there. There's no way to put Sedna where it is. It never comes close enough to be affected by the sun, but it never goes far enough to be affected by the stars. Now, this, this fellow Brown is part of a Caltech team that claims to have discovered the ninth planet earlier this year, in 2016. And, and as you know, Pluto's been demoted. It's no longer considered a planet. But Brown's calculations suggest Nemesis or the ninth planet, whatever they want to call it, is ten times the mass of Earth. 
Now, science also knows, as I mentioned, that binary star systems are very common in our galaxy. And red dwarfs are very common. They're the most common type of star in the galaxy. So the existence of Planet X, the Planet X system, is therefore quite in line with the current knowledge base. But to wrap it up, this so-called ninth planet, recently disclosed in January of this year by the NASA people, never a straight answer, is a combination, in my opinion, of information and disinformation. It's what we would call in the intel community a Bush League type of propaganda. My advice to anybody thinking about this or thinking about doing too much research on on this, uh, quote, discovery of the ninth planet, don't major on minors. Don't, I don't study their announcement too much or pay much attention to it. Now, the real planet X is in the vicinity of Mars and fast approaching Earth. It has no direct relationship or indirect relationship to this recent discovery. And this so-called discovery is just one more piece of evidence, in my opinion, that the powers that be are running scared and making mistakes as they go. Well, certainly making mistakes as they go sounds like a, a, a common theme for them. You know, and, and also you look at so much today as far as pollution and, you know, just, just the fracking that's going on around the world right now. There's so much oil that's available. They're running out of space to put it. And if those things go, you know, it's it, it, those fracking systems. And like, let's look at L.A., for example, all the methane that's getting leaked out there. There's just this huge emergency. It's not really being talked about much now. It was a few weeks ago, but now it's hush hush. You know, who knows how many people are going to be affected by that? You've got these nuclear reactors next to fault lines. I think there's 55 nuclear reactors next to the Madrid fault line alone. You've got, right. you know, the San Andreas fault line and. You look at Fukushima and what happened out there and how much pollution uh, to the environment from these nuclear active particulates that are just all over the place now. And I wonder what's going to happen, like you said, if there's just this giant blackout and if power isn't available to these nuclear facilities or if there is an earthquake and some of these reactors get uh, you know, affected by it, how are they going to keep the rods cool? What happens if Carlsbad, New Mexico, where they've got just – tons and tons of nuclear waste there what happens if something goes out there you know what's next how do people protect themselves is it do they even want to be protected or would they be better off just dying quickly well very good points you know uh there's the uh the fellow i'm sure you've heard of J.R. moore the radio show and he's interviewed some u.s navy veterans and they were told the end results of all this but they really weren't told the why of it and he was told it on a discreet basis you've they have seen the U.S. Navy map of future America where the coasts yeah. are flooded and so forth. Well, now you know that the magnetic poles have been shifting towards Russia at maybe 40 miles an hour a year. But when Planet X arrives, the physical poles will shift. Now, this, this will create some hyper-earthquake tsunamis and, and the shifting of land masses. So if you want to look at a few different states, one, one thing people can do to protect themselves is simply be in the right location when it happens. Now, there's a few states to avoid. And California is highly dangerous. It's it's composed of rock plates. Now, when rock is compressed, it breaks. And you'll see the crumbling of rock, of course, as its mass goes upwards. Now, the West Coast will have major catastrophic changes, with synergistic proportions, tidal waves, high hurricane force winds, earthquakes on the fault lines, volcanic activity over the magma, forest fires caused by, the, you know, the... Uh, the, the, what's in the tail of Planet X, and also caused by volcanic explosions, severe lightning storms. So it's highly dangerous. And I think the long-term danger is in riding out the shifts for those who are living near the boundaries of plates. Now, cities without mountains as a backdrop can just be washed out to sea. Uh, you'll have broken gas and water lines. San Francisco, it's on the San Andreas and other fault lines. A lot of the population will be trapped. Water will overflow. The city's survival will be minimal. California is not a good bet. Now, the area around Arizona, on the other hand, uh, the Hoover Dam probably won't survive because of earthquake activity. And you'll have rivers flooding, and areas within rivers should probably be avoided. But you look at Phoenix and some of these main cities. Arizona has withstood many a pole shift. The area around Tucson is safe. Florida is another very dangerous state. Its highest elevation is 105 meters in the panhandle. And uh, But as for Central and South Florida and the Keys, these parts can be devastated by a tide of water. Colorado, for example, is a safe area. The domestic division of the CIA is relocating to Colorado. That should give, you know, viewers many clues right there. Right. The eastern Colorado, you know, has descends into plains, has rivers. Some of these may be a 
port of safety. And of course, one of the safest parts of the country is the Ozarks, northern Arkansas, southern Missouri, average elevation close to 1,000 feet, self-sufficient water supply, agricultural land. They'll do well. They're also isolated from large metropolitan areas, and they're well enough inland to avoid flooding through, you know, tidal waves. So it's a part of the preparation is probably geographic. But I would expect when it hits, when you see this object in the sky, you'll have one to two days to accumulate all of the emergency food and water you can. I would accumulate at least a three-month supply. Now, the strange thing is about this whole thing is that Congress could have done something about this electrical grid. It, it, it could solve it for three, four, five hundred million dollars. They've never done anything to harden it. The, the military has parts of their grid hardened, but the Congress has never done anything. And yet they know that the estimate of a three-month downward collapse of the U.S. electrical grid will cost the nation in excess of five trillion dollars. So uh, I, I don't understand the thinking, but this is Congress, you know, so <laughs> that's it. I think they're probably trying to protect themselves as well. Maybe they are being offered a, a nice, you know, one-bedroom apartment, about 15 right. stories underground, and they'll be okay. They won't have to worry about anything during the, the catastrophe. But, I mean, how long is this going to last? Well, the effects could last as long as the electrical grid is down. When the electrical grid is down, as you know, uh, you'll have a certain percentage of automobiles that simply and trucks that will simply fail because of the EMP pulse. Uh, the an EMP pulse for for your listeners who maybe are not too familiar with it, it basically uh, can occur several ways. One way it can occur is through a nuclear explosion. For example, if North Korea were to uh, have a rogue container ship or something like that, and they were outside the continental United States, or Russia had a drone submarine, and they exploded a nuclear weapon of a certain tonnage, a certain blast radius, 250 miles above Kansas City, it would basically knock out 99% of our electrical grid, as well as part of Mexico and Canada. But uh, an EMP effect from the sun, a solar flare, can do that as well. And let me explain a little bit about solar flares. The biggest flares to date are called X-class flares. And now Y-class exists, but they're off the charts. Now, as I mentioned, the Earth is surrounded by the magnetosphere. It begins at about 1,000 kilometers and goes many more into space. And the Sun and the Earth's magnetic field create this layer. But NASA discovered through a Themis mission that the Earth's magnetic field contains a hole, which is 10 times larger than they previously believed. Now, the magnetosphere shelters us from solar flares, but the hole is now four times the size of the Earth. So, in any case, the risk assessment, the worst case scenario, is if you have a violent CME that accompanies a Y-class solar flare would come to us in a one-two punch, that would send the part of the Earth exposed to it back to the 1850s. It would affect all circuitry, all electronics. You wouldn't be able to do banking. There wouldn't be food after a day or two because there wouldn't be transportation. Only military... Uh, you know, facilities would really survive and prosper, but not civilian facilities. And uh, it's it's similar. You know, the last we don't really have any experience with it in the last hundred years. In the late summer of 1859, the Carrington event happened. That was a great solar storm that hit the planet, and that was a coronal mass ejection from the sun, and um, that affected telegraph lines and and burned them up. But uh, that's. That's about all. That was the greatest solar storm in recorded history. And the electrical grid was in its infancy, you know, a few telegraph wires in larger cities. And it did short-circuit the wires. It caused massive fires. The aurora borealis was seen, I think, as far south as Cuba, Rome, and Hawaii. And uh, in 1989 and 94, I think going forward, you had minor solar storms that knocked out communication satellites and shut down power plants, disrupted the electrical grid. But these were minor solar flares. So imagine if a solar storm the size of 1859 struck our modern society. You've got delicate wires that run everywhere, filaments, computer chips, uh, hard drives, cell phones, electrical lines, and your vehicle's computer system. And so uh, the perfect solar storm could uh, send the country back to, uh, you know, the, the Stone Age basically for anywhere from three months to... I don't know how long. It's really hard to say. It, it would depend on the damage to the transformers and how quickly they were able to be repaired or replaced. And
going to hit us, it's going to hit us hard. And it's going to be 200 mile an hour winds. And it's going to be massive tidal waves and earthquakes. They claim, according to special operations, four-star generals, that literally it, it causes a person to go to pieces. I'll throw 2017 out, and you can take that to the bank. What should give us hope? That this is a turning point. That this is the moment we finally determined we would save our planet. You're doomed. So the hell with it. <laughs> Enjoy the ride. I tell people who are interested in this. We, we all call it Planet X or Nibiru, but it is a dwarf star. It's either a red dwarf or a brown dwarf star. Now the object, which is clearly Planet X by deductive logic process elimination, is therefore now between Mars and Jupiter. It's not in the outer reaches of the solar system. It can clearly be seen, especially from the southern hemisphere. The implications and the side effects of what might happen to us here on Earth is pretty scary. We're going to get into some of that. Now one of the cool things that David discusses with us here is instead of having to just take his word for it, he gives you coordinates on where you can actually see it for yourself. Mid-2017, he says, we're going to see an eclipse with Nibiru. He has been able to take his background and transition it into research on Planet X and has recently compiled an awesome book with a treasure trove of information. David, how the heck are you? Very good tonight, sir. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I appreciate you coming on here with us. I know that you had reached out to us a few weeks ago. You've got a really cool book coming up here that's going to break everything down with Nibiru. You know, let's talk about what you do. Well, the way I got into it, I have always believed in following the money. About five years ago, uh, I got into some research on the Pentagon black budget. And I don't know if you recall, but you probably do, that the day before 9-11, Don Rumsfeld announced at a Pentagon news conference that the uh, agency was 2.2 trillion short money was simply missing 2.2 not billion but trillion so uh, having worked for a period of time at the Pentagon I realized this was most likely black budget funds and I did some investigation and I ran across uh, a couple of areas uh, basically the deep underground military base research done by Jesse Ventura done by Phil Schneider done by other personalities and I realized of course that's likely the source of the lost money. It's black budget ops and it's being spent. And why is it being spent in terms of these type of uh, bases? So that's how my curiosity was, was picked, you might say. These bases, I understand, are built away primarily from geologic tectonic areas. But again, when Planet X passes, you're going to have new geotectonic faults established when you have force 11, 12, 13, 14 earthquakes. So I don't know how safe they're going to be. It could be a lost investment for those people. In any case, that was my basic introduction about five years ago. And then I got into the science of the, of the topic. My understanding, and this is partly from Phil Schneider. I know he worked 11 years at Groom Lake, Area 51. He says the black budget varies between 0.2 trillion and 1.2 trillion per year. I'm not sure when the inception started. It was absolutely going on in the late 70s and 80s. He says a couple of dozen of these may be reasonable for protection. I agree, nuclear protection. But the question is, why do we have over 130 of these? That doesn't really make any sense unless, obviously, Planet X is, is absolutely a fact, which it is. Well, so, you know, four years ago, I remember reading an article on Yahoo News that claimed eventually people are going to be able to look up in the sky and they're going to see what looks like a second sun but really it's a giant sun that exploded I think they said it was Beetlejuice or something like that so in my mind when I read stuff like that in the news I think it's you know the the forces behind the scenes or whoever's kind of orchestrating the media prepping people you know subconsciously getting them ready for this type of event first it's just a an explosion that looks like a sun and then hey oh it is a sun so I mean do you have any physical evidence like pictures that you can say without a shadow of a doubt or files or white papers? Yes, I do. In fact, there's some very good videos on the internet itself that are good photographic analysis. There's one 
called multiple suns rise over Halifax, Nova Scotia. Those are the keywords that a person would enter on YouTube to read it or view it. And you can see the sun. And then at the three o'clock position, you have Planet X. To the right of Planet X, you have a separate lens flare. Now that doesn't reflect the lens flare, of course, in the water below. But Planet X is generating its own light and you can see its reflection, therefore, in the water below. Next, I think a fog bank moves in and it obscures the sun, but Planet X is still visible. A lens flare cannot do this. Now that's one good example of something they could simply look up themselves on YouTube. There's also some good uh, Davis Station South Pole videos out there. And there's, in my book, which is Planet X, The Arrival in 2017 by David Bede on Amazon, I've done a uh, video, it's on page 15 or 16 or so of the book, and I have a section called Photographic Analysis of Planet X, and I study one video which another analyst did an extensive study on. And let me just sort of explain what happened. A uh, fellow named Glenn Vaughn on April 11th, 2015, was flying down the Pacific side of Central America. He's a professor, an ex-professor at uh, California University. He took a 20 megapixel raw file with a Sony digital camera and he confirmed the report by sending it in to a particular analyst for review. He took it through an aircraft window. Now an analysis of the metadata indicated it was taken at 240 dpi, very high resolution, and the metadata further showed the date, the time, the GPS coordinates. I think it was a Sony DSC HX 50V camera. In any case, using Starry Night Professional version, the video, which is referenced in my book and which is on YouTube, did a field of view analysis and he determined Mercury is above, in other words, superior conjunction with the Sun, and the object in the field of view, therefore, is not Mercury. Mercury does not have wings as does this object, and Mercury does not have the brightness or contrast of the unknown object. Now, the analyst also performed a gamma test on a paint program. Gamma testing shows if an object is hot or cold. Hot objects generate, of course, their own light like our Sun. A lens flare would be a cold object. They read direct light, they don't generate it. So he started with a gamma of 1, reducing it by steps. At point 10, the gamma illustrates stark differences. At point 01, he shows the hottest, brightest objects on the video. He then reduced brightness to a value, I think, of minus 3 in contrast to plus 2. The hot objects fade in together, proving they're genuine. Then he ran a luminous test to determine the intensity of the object, and he determined it was behind the sun, not a reflection. There are actually wings on the object, which is clearly behind the sun. Now. He stated this is deeply disturbing. The reason is that gas tails of comets follow solar winds, and they're not visible until the comet's orbit is inside of Jupiter, at which point, uh, normally the luminosity at that point of the sun makes the tails of the comet or the planet visible. Of course, Planet X, we, we all call it Planet X or Nibiru, but it is a dwarf star. It's either a red dwarf or a brown dwarf star. Now, the object, which is clearly Planet X by deductive logic process elimination, is therefore now between Mars and Jupiter. It's not in the outer reaches of the solar system. It can clearly be seen, especially from the southern hemisphere. Now, as of April 2015, therefore, the date of that video and the analysis, Nibiru is close enough to the sun so that the sun's light is reflected uh, to the tail, making it appearing like wings. And there's one other quick comment I'd make, because actually that uh, video had two parts. The second part was a lady who lives near where I do, Sanibel Allen, Florida, Melissa Huffman. Now you can look at this video itself on YouTube. I think it has more or less gone viral and nearly a million people have looked at it. And this is a 2015 video. The object is very interesting. She pans the sky and shows the object and then the moon. Now it's clearly a planet visible just north of the sun. Now using Stellarium and knowing the moon phases, comparing it to her video on the moon, you can go to the drive date take away the atmosphere and the ocean, and you can determine the relationship of the stars to the horizon. So to determine the date, you basically just use moon charts, and the moon is well below the horizon and all dates have for September 26, 2015, therefore the video was taken earlier. Now September 2015 moon phases give us a comparable to the moon in the video, and if you look at the moon phases diagram to the actual picture of the moon, it has to have been photographed on September 23rd, 2015, based on moon phasing. Now, on that date, Mercury in Stellarium is very dim, somewhat above the horizon. Also, I believe it's in a different location than the unknown object. All the other planets are below the horizon. The video, therefore, conclusively and plainly shows an unidentified planet 
or dwarf star, planet X, of some significant magnitude quite clearly. So I can reach no other conclusion, and the analyst did himself, then this is a rare photo from this hemisphere of planet X approaching us. Wow. You know, and there's also speculation now, and I hadn't heard this until about a year ago, that not only is planet X going to come our way, this dwarf star, but also a bunch of planets with it, like it's bringing in its own solar system. Is there evidence or truth to that? Right. There's a number of videos there. I've seen some real good ones from the South Pole Telescope, and they indicate that there are a variety of moons around this. It's basically, as you say, it's its own solar system. A lot of people don't realize this, but binary, what we've got in our solar system here, is obviously a binary twin. 76%, this is a fact, of all stars are binary twins. In fact, 16% are trinary twins. There are three suns, but ours has a, a binary companion, and it comes under the name of Planet X, Nibiru, and so forth, Nemesis, there are various names to it. But ours has a binary twin, and it's a very common. It's extremely common, and it's basically what is approaching us, and apparently, from all descriptions, indications, reports, insider reports, photographs, and other sources of human and signal intelligence, it contains five to seven moons around it. So it's a solar system approaching our solar system, which makes it extremely dangerous. The red dragon of Revelation 12 may well be, and I believe rather obviously is planet X, as it's referred to in an earlier chapter of Revelation, I think Revelation chapter 8, in a similar manner. A colleague of mine at the university, uh, one university in the western U.S., brought up a very interesting point, perhaps a cover-up to my intention. Here it is. Basically, he said, the areas of the dragon anomaly have been covered or patched up by Google Sky in the past. But one of the ways to actually see what is behind this patched out area is to use a program called Skyview by NASA. Skyview, what that is, it's a virtual observatory on the net that generates images of any part of the sky from wavelengths of all regimes, radio to gamma. You just filter it. Now when you view these images in various filters, you can see the actual color of this anomaly in Virgo is red, and it does look very menacing as it appears to have a face like a dragon with two profound eyes. It's very intriguing and quite strange. Now, just for your listeners, I'll provide very briefly the right ascension and declination if they want to go to Skyview. And here it is. Just cut and paste this coordinate. Here's the right ascension. 13 hours, 50 minutes, 44 seconds. Here's the declination. And that would be minus 8 hours, 50, rather 13 minutes and 59.7 seconds. So right ascension is the celestial equivalent of longitude and uh, in the sky latitude is called declination. So you just enter those coordinates and then on sky view you just choose the iris 100 micron telescope setting and there you are. You've never seen an object quite like this one. Now the sign itself might be a sweeping parenthetic of that entire biblical 70th week of Daniel which is a key to solving the most complex cryptogram in existence, the book of the apocalypse. As to what it is, the astronomical scientific community I think is keeping a very low profile and the question is, why did they ever cover it up to begin with? Well, and you know, not only that, if um, if we could get into some of the more you know scientific stuff as well, because it's so close now, it's it's a it's different. When it was first observed, probably the first time it was actually observed, it was observed in the infrared spectrum in 1983 by a uh, orbiting Earth satellite telescope called the Infrared Astronomical Satellite. And this is when all those articles appeared in the Washington Post and the New York Times and so forth. And that's when, right before blackout occurred, there were some articles over a six to 12 month period of time when it was pretty much spoken freely of. And then all of a sudden, they I think they realized the seriousness of the matter and they went ahead and produced a blackout. Now, remember this, the blue daytime sky is going to hide planet X until it eclipses the sun. But there is going to be a full disk solar eclipse right after September 23rd, 2017. This occurs, if you look at moon charts, on October 5th, 2017. And what happens, of course, during a full disk solar eclipse is the sky turns black. And that will reveal, at that point, that week, in my opinion, the week of October 5th to 12th, according, if the book of Revelation is true, because this ties in perfectly with it, that could well be the exact month that we can first see it with the naked eye. So 
in my opinion, combined with a predictive computer-generated astronomical model, the Bible, the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, tells us that the red dragon, or planet X, or Nibiru, appears after September 23rd, 17, but it has to appear before October 11th, 2017. At that date, October 11th, 2017, the sign in Virgo, the woman Virgo, will no longer be, quote, pregnant. Then the red dragon or planet X, therefore, must make it a, an appearance before October 11th. So that seems to be a, a cutoff date. Jupiter, is, which is known as the planet or the star of the Messiah, exits Virgo, the Virgin, on October 11th, after having spent, I believe, 301 days or about 42 weeks in the, quote, womb region of that constellation. And again, after that point, the woman will no longer be pregnant. So that gives us a very narrow window just to use the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse as sort of an intel briefing. And the great sign of the woman is described in Revelation 12, 1 to 2, forms and lasts for a few hours. And according again to astronomical models, this sign has never before occurred in human history. It will occur once on September 23rd, 27. It will never occur again. And I believe it places us right at the time frame from that analysis of the planet X approach to the Earth. I would prepare on or before the fall of 2017. Uh, I would conduct emergency preparedness. Of course, you want to be spiritually ready. You want to have a clear conscience and all that. But you need to do physical preparations as well. I think uh, survival gear, emergency food, that sort of thing. And the reason is... Uh, that again, all, all this while you're going to get ex increasing levels of disinformation from the mass media until it's actually there. And then they're going to say, whoops, we didn't have any notice, we don't know what happened, and so forth. And they're going to run and hide in what they've already established. But, you know, the public is there and the public has to fend for itself. Uh, this global warming, as you've heard, I'm sure, is a cover story. The Earth is heating up from the core outward because of the approach of Planet X. During the 20th century, I think there were 35 volcanic eruptions in a typical year. Now there are more than 35 of these every single day. So basically, when X approaches, that week you see it in the sky, let's say it's October of 2017, you know, for purposes of discussion. At that point, it's not going to actually collide, I don't believe, with the Earth. The Earth is only 8,000 miles in diameter. It may pass 5, 10, 15 million miles away. But it has a very high magnetic attraction. It's going to have a gravitronic effect. It's going to cause the shifting of the Earth's crust. Uh, it's going to cause major volcanic activity. It's going to cause tidal waves. And when a pole shift happens, the ocean literally comes up out of its basin. So you're going to have major weather changes, seismic activity, and volcanic eruptions. Probably at that point, Yellowstone, uh, the Yellowstone Super Caldera, will likely erupt. That could affect up to a third of the United States covered with ash. Well, let me jump in here for a second. I'm glad you brought that up because you can clearly tell a difference now with how hot the sun is. I mean, even if you look at the same temperature, you know, 75 degrees now versus 75 degrees 10 years ago, although it's the same temperature, the sun on your skin even, it feels, it, there's just more heat there. If you go to the book of uh, Revelation, the uh, revelation indicates that the sun is going to be hotter at that time frame. Now, the EMP effect, Planet X has a massive tail. It's fantastically charged. It's magnetic. The tail has moons and rocks in it. Now, this can down aircraft and satellite when it passes. It can affect the electrical grid. Now, of course, NASA, JPL, and the other disinformation sources ignore this data. But here's, here are the facts. The Earth has a nickel and iron core. Now, this generates its magnetic field. However, the magnetosphere has large holes in it. The magnetosphere is a static shield. Now, under routine solar conditions, it protects the Earth from coronal mass ejections. But when Planet X arrives, we're no longer under routine solar conditions. Now, you know that the magnetic poles have been shifting towards Russia at maybe 40 miles an hour a year. But when Planet X arrives, the physical poles will shift. Now, this, this will create some hyper-earthquakes, tsunamis, and, and the shifting of land masses. So, if you want to look at a few different states, one, one thing people can do to protect themselves is simply be in the right location when it happens. Now, there's a few states to avoid, and California is highly dangerous. It's, it's composed of rock plates, and when rock is compressed, it breaks, and you'll see the crumbling of rock, of course, as its mass goes upwards. Now, the West Coast will have major catastrophic changes, synergistic proportions, tidal waves, high hurricane force winds, earthquakes on the fault lines, volcanic activity over the magma. 
So it's highly dangerous. And I think the long-term danger is in riding out the ships for those who are living near the boundaries of plates. Now, cities without mountains as a backdrop can just be washed out to sea. Uh, you'll have broken gas and water lines. San Francisco, it's on the San Andreas and other fault lines. A lot of the population will be trapped. Water will overflow. The city's survival will be minimal. California is not a good bet. Now, the area around Arizona, on the other hand, uh, the Hoover Dam probably won't survive because of earthquake activity. And you'll have rivers flooding, and areas within rivers should probably be avoided. But you look at Phoenix and some of these main cities. Arizona has withstood many a pole shift. The area around Tucson is safe. Florida's another very dangerous state. Its highest elevation is 105 meters in the panhandle. And, uh, but as for Central and South Florida and the Keys, these parts can be devastated by tidal water. Colorado, for example, is a safe area. The domestic division of the CIA is relocating to Colorado. That should give you know, viewers many clues right there. And of course, one of the safest parts of the country is the Ozarks, northern Arkansas, southern Missouri. Average elevation close to 1,000 feet. Self-sufficient water supply, agricultural land, they'll do well. They're also isolated from large metropolitan areas. And they're well enough inland to avoid flooding through, you know, tidal waves. So it's a part of the preparation is probably geographic. But I would expect when it hits, when you see this object in the sky, you'll have one to two days to accumulate all of the emergency food and water you can. I would accumulate at least a three-month supply. Uh, I would highly recommend people educate themselves, understand the whole picture, and uh, probably take action at that point.